Thank you for joining us in Finding God in the world of video games. We have a public service announcement for everybody today. Are you, or perhaps someone you love, experiencing these symptoms? Sudden spasms of uncontrollable movement, followed by shrieks of anger, maybe unexplainable loss of direction, or an embarrassing loss of control in high pressure situations. Well, as much as I'm embarrassed to admit this, I am coming forward to identify as someone who struggles in this area. I mean, it happened right in front of my beautiful wife. What? When? When did this happen? I mean, I don't recall ever being there. I mean, was it the other day when we were maybe, you know, driving and you took the wrong exit, you know, again? No, Are no, sure? wasn't that. That was the traffic's fault. Okay, and even sure, though I know sure. I'm getting <laughs> older and it wasn't even my fault, I still felt a flash of humiliation anyways. And I thought maybe my bravery in admitting this will help others to come forward. So let me share my story. There I was, minding my own business, just watching for everything to line up just right so I could move forward, and then disaster struck. I wasn't even doing anything. I was just waiting patiently for my turn, coordinating my next move with my wife, and then it happened. What is even happening right now? I couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it. And there it was. I, he's the only I just I turned just around. I slowly walked away from her. And I just kept walking until I walked right off the edge. All of our hard work to get to this point in the level was completely erased because we, like so many others around the world, were impacted by the pain and frustration of Joy-Con drift. Oh, okay. Well, that's a relief. What did you think I was <laughs> okay, talking so that about? makes a lot more sense. What did sense? any of you think I was I talking about? I thought you were about? just blaming the oh, controller for books. your own mistake until I saw so many other people, you know, have the exact same problem. That it's, I... it's a big, big problem. If you, I like really... us, have a Nintendo Switch console, you may have already felt this pain. After yeah. about two years of faithful service, one of our Joy-Con controllers here just started inexplicably drifting off oh, on its after own. after two years. It started after like a couple months. <laughs> well, true. <laughs> but to you, it happened It just started years. becoming a problem. <laughs> For you. <laughs> At first, it was almost imperceptible. I thought maybe I was just playing poorly. Maybe I was just making some mistakes. But then it became much more pronounced, and my characters just started moving on their own, even when the controller wasn't being held. And suddenly, all those previous errors, that they started to make a lot more sense. And I realized... I wasn't necessarily losing my gaming skills, it was my controller that had been letting me down. And as soon as I switched to using a separate wireless controller, my problems disappeared completely. But even though swapping for another controller finally allowed us to finish those levels that required very precise inputs with no room for such errors. I mean like walking the, off the edge like for no reason? Like walking off the edge all the time, Mario. <laughs> oh dang, Mario. <laughs> the, the, the true problem still remained. Our beloved Joy-Cons that came with our Switch from day one were flawed. And all of our personal efforts to calibrate them had no effect, unfortunately. And we watched multiple YouTube videos, we listened to advice from others who had the same problem, and I finally came to this horrible yet obvious conclusion. My Joy-Con controllers would have to be sent off to the manufacturer for repair. Now, it may seem like a simple solution, but here's the problem. I'm not a simple guy. I have procrastinated <laughs> no, on this for so long that I've just come to accept that my controller is flawed. And I just kind of expect random controller-based deaths to occur on a semi-regular basis now. <laughs> I Honestly, I just don't want to go through the hassle of contacting Nintendo, shipping these off, being without them until they finally get returned. It just, it, it seems like a big pain. Listen, he doesn't even like returning Amazon packages to UPS, which I is don't. right down the street from us. Nope. Okay, that's how... That's how just, just inefficient. Just, I just wish we hadn't ordered it. I know, exactly. I would rather just accept that these Joy Cons, that they're the flawed creation that they are, mm -hmm. and deal with the ramifications of their unpredictable failures as they occur. And now that I know I'm not the only one who's struggling with this, it's actually kind of easier to just accept things the way they are than to take the time and effort to get them fixed, even though Nintendo has, has proclaimed that they will do so for free if I will simply let them. Does any of this sound familiar to you yet? And no, I'm not just talking about the Joy-Con controller failure here. I'm talking about us, you and me. Here's the tough reality that we must accept. As valiantly as we have tried to survive and thrive on this planet by playing this game with a controller that was flawed from day one, we can't do it. Now sure, we can fake it on the easy parts, and every now and then we may get lucky on the more difficult parts, and our Joy-Con drift 
won't reveal itself. But make no mistake, it is still in there, waiting to pounce at the worst possible time and undo all of the hard work we have done to try to conceal it, adapt to it, or make excuses for it. It is our sinful nature as human beings. We were born with it. We have fought with it. And on some occasions, we have all simply decided to just accept it and run with it. And we have to do something about it because all of our best efforts to repair it simply do not work. Over the last two weeks, we have taken a deeper dive into a few of the critical foundations of the Christian faith in our Knowing is Half the Battle series. If you missed those, I would strongly recommend catching up on them first before we move further. This week, we are stepping even deeper into those waters because there is a prerequisite to each of these that is often misunderstood or perhaps glazed over in our Christian walk. It is the concept of repentance. And in every instance Christ and his followers shared the good news with others, it is the absolute starting point of the journey. Look at Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Matthew 4.17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jump to Acts 2.38. This is after Christ has been crucified and resurrected, and Peter said to the people who were listening to his sermon, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Without belaboring the point, <laughs> it is clear that repentance is the foundational aspect of moving forward in the kingdom of God. But many of us have probably heard that word so many times that we may be guilty of glossing over its actual meaning. The word repentance used here in the Greek for each of these verses, and I apologize if I butcher this, but honestly, you probably don't speak any more Greek than I do. So it's <laughs> metaneo, and it is actually a compound word. It's two words that make this up, meta and noeo. Meta means change afterward, meaning you know what results after an activity. And then the second half of that word says, to apply mental effort needed to reach bottom line conclusion. So when we put these two words together, we get the definition after a change of mind to think differently afterwards. This is the definition of repentance, the only scriptural definition and the one used in every one of those verses that we just described and any other place you see the word occur. Yet so many of the people that I speak to consider repentance to be like some secret password to enter the clubhouse of God. Simply quote a sinner's prayer saying we are sorry for our sins, ask for forgiveness, and repentance has occurred. But the word repentance, if we take it literally, which is the way it tends to be meant, has nothing to do with simply being remorseful for our past conduct or its consequences. Yes, we should absolutely feel convicted of the sins that we have committed. And it is absolutely right that we seek forgiveness for them. But repentance is not merely some prayer we say. It is a change in the way we think. And it is for those outside of the path of Christ, as well as those who have already signed up for the journey. Now, I don't know what you might be thinking. Are you sure about that? Well, don't take our word for it. Take the words of our Creator. Jump, first of all, to Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. It says, the angel of the church in Pergamos write to him, these things, says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was a faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, commit sexual immorality. You also hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Hope you caught that in all of that stuff. Repent. Maybe you're not convinced. Well, like my close personal friend, Captain America <laughs> likes to say, I can do this all day. Revelation 3, <laughs> verses 1 through 3. <laughs> to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things says he, capital H, he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Here we go. <laughs> this is the Lord, okay, very, very clearly, this is God. 
he is speaking to the churches, okay? Both of those churches. And he even specifically commended the church at Pergamos for holding to his name, choosing to not, to not deny the faith, which implies that they are still within the faith, okay? But they still needed to repent, to change their mind, and think differently about sinful conduct that remained present even after their conversion. Here is the painful Joy-Con drifting truth. Salvation in Christ does not completely remove our sinful nature. It gives us access to the one who we can reach out to in our moment of need for the strength and guidance to overcome those temptations. We see that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. With each temptation will make the way of escape so you may be able to bear it. If you are confused at why your, con why your conversion to following Christ did not immediately remove all the temptations out of your life, don't fret and do not for one second believe the lie of the enemy that this somehow means that your conversion was illegitimate, fake, or non-existent non simply because you still face temptations and battle your sinful nature. So here's a secret. We all do. Me. You. The big pastor of the mega church down the road, especially the big pastor of the mega church down the road, <laughs> and even the Apostle Paul you might say, whoa, 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 now you've gone off the deep end, sir. Well, let's let Paul do the talking for himself. Romans chapter 7, it's verses 15 through 25, and I'm, I don't normally read this long of a selection, but I think it's very important that we hear exactly what he has to say here. And this is Paul speaking from a first-person perspective. What I am doing, I do not understand. What I will to do, that I do not practice. What I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law is good, but now it is no longer I who does it, but the sin that dwells in me. I know that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. The good that I will to do, I do not do. The evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I that does it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. I delight in the law of God and the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, hear this. This is Paul. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, I know that was really long, especially for one of our videos, but it is critical that we all understand this. Christians still face temptation. Christians still wrestle with their sinful nature. Christians still sin. Through Christ and Him alone can we have deliverance from those sinful desires and fleshly urges. But it is not some magical, supernatural, super spiritual thing that occurs that makes us rise above all of those things. I and mean, look closely at what Paul said there at the end with his mind. He serves the law of God with his flesh, the law of sin. And there it is, the same root word for mind that we found earlier in the word repentance. This is a changing of the way we think, which in turn changes the way we act. Repentance is a deliberate, conscious mental choice to view our temptation of sin differently than we used to. It is our sinful human nature that causes us to drift. But what do we do about that drifting, or excuse me, what we do about that drifting is up to us. We can keep holding these same Joy-Con controllers in our hands, try to do this in our own strength and determination, and simply accept that this is the way it is. Or we can stop being stubborn, and we can take our controller back to the manufacturer for replacement, even if it's inconvenient, difficult, or a longer process than we would like. And in this analogy, it is our mind that is the controller that must be renewed. It is not a one-time action, even though that would be very convenient. 
it is something we'll have to bring back to him for calibrations daily and throughout the day until our time here is over. Repentance at the time of our conversion to Christ is not a one-time replacement of our mind. It is simply step one of the process. So, your Joy-Con likes to drift. Mine does too. But as soon as we recognize that drifting has returned, it's time for replacement, refurbishment, or recalibration. Repentance is not a dirty word. It is a core part of the curriculum. We will be performing this action all the time. Anytime our flesh starts to take control and pulls us back towards destruction, Joy-Con drift is real. Even if it was the dirty secret that nobody wanted to talk about until everyone else started admitting they have the same problem. Our sinful nature will be a foe that we will wrestle with every day until we leave this plane of existence. It says that in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But we have a creator who will quickly restore us to factory default settings every time we reach out to him in repentance and ask him one more time to renew our minds. Thank you.